Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples. Jesus said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone in debt to us, and do not subject us to the final test. And Jesus said to them, Suppose one of you has a friend to whom he goes at midnight and says, Friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived at my house from a journey, and I have nothing to offer him. And he says in reply from within, Do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children and I are already in bed. I cannot get up to give you anything. I tell you, if he does not get up to give the visitor the loaves because of their friendship, he will get up to give him whatever he needs because of his persistence. And I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For every one who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. What father among you would hand his son a snake when he asks for a fish, or hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg? If you then, who are wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven Give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him. The Gospel of the Lord. The disciples of our Lord came and said, teach us how to pray. Jesus, as we heard, responded by basically providing the Our Father. If we take the shorter version from St. Luke's Gospel given to the disciples and combine it with St. Matthew's version that we find Jesus presenting in the Sermon on the Mount, and we combine the two, we have the Our Father that we say to this very day. This is the one prayer that our Lord taught us. This, the saints say, is the perfect prayer. It gives us an outline for our whole spirituality. If you go to the Catechism, to the fourth section on spiritual, spirituality, they do a whole explication of the different verses of the Our Father, a good, worthwhile read for all of us. Even in the early church, in the first Catechism called the Didache, the teachings of the Twelve Apostles, we're instructed to say the Our Father three times a day, morning, evening, and before bed. This is a prayer that's included in all of our sacraments, including our Mass here today. And so, the perfect prayer. The challenge for us, though, is that we've at times become so comfortable with it, having memorized the prayer, said it so often, we don't really pray it. We say the words, but we aren't praying. So it's important that we pause and reflect on the beauty of this prayer so we can pray it better. So we begin by addressing our Heavenly Father, who loves us. Jesus referred to his Father as Father. For the Jewish people, the Father was the creator, the life giver. For us, though, there's even a greater intimacy. In the actual Hebrew text of Matthew, that word Father is Abba, which would be better translated as like Daddy. It's more the familiar, childlike, intimate term used. So the same way that the Father not just created us, not just gave us life, the Father so loved us, he gave us our Savior. Jesus, making that saving action through his passion, death, and resurrection, the graces of which we receive beginning at baptism, has brought us into union with the Heavenly Father. We're the adopted children. We aren't just creatures. We're the adopted children of God. We also are part of a family that we could call simply the church. That's why 
in the Our Father, you notice that all the pronouns are plural. That Our Father, give us, forgive us, deliver us. So we're praying not just individually, we're praying as a family. Therefore, the Heavenly Father looks upon us through the eyes of His Son. How beautiful that is. Now with that said, I realize in our world today, for some people, especially young people, this could be difficult because they don't have an understanding of father. Maybe many kids have never had a father, or maybe they haven't had the father they ought to have had. So the language could become a problem. So what to do? Look to Jesus. That's the key. Because Jesus even said to his apostles at the Last Supper, if you see me, you see the Father. If you hear me, you hear the Father. So if we want to see the face of the Father, we look at Jesus. That's the beauty. So even though we might not have the relationship we ought to have had with a human Father, looking to Jesus, we can be called to love intimately the Heavenly Father. So with all of that then, we begin a series of petitions. We say, thy kingdom come. We remember, life is not just about here and now. If we think that our little kingdom of wealth, power, position, whatever it may be, is going to last, we're wrong. We all die and leave it behind. So we live now in union with our Lord in a state of sanctifying grace, but we're always remembering the kingdom is to come. We have our hearts set on heaven. That's where we want to be. So no matter what we have in this life, no matter what our little kingdom is, what's important is living life now with our Lord and looking to life forever in heaven. And with that, then we pray, thy will be done. Here we're saying we will do God's will. God's will is to do good. You and I are called then to live by the commandments, to live by the word of God, the teachings of the church. We're called to enact that will by doing the good corporal and spiritual works of mercy. We pray, give us this day our daily bread. So we aren't praying to win the lottery, we're praying for what we need today. Whatever we need to sustain us spiritually as well as physically. Yes, we can plan for the future, so we ask for forgiveness. Notice though, it's that plural pronoun. So we're even praying for those people we know who might be caught in sin, who might have the most hard heart because of sin. Notice then that we pray also that we seek forgiveness as we forgive others. So we're called to forgive. Forgiveness is not just a feeling, it's an act of our intellect and will. We know, as Jesus said, we need to forgive. Even from the cross, Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So for all of us here, rather than have a hurt, grudge, hatred, anything like that, we ask to forgive. Feelings can come later, but the action, that act of the intellect and the will, is there. Again, we're, play, we're praying in a plural, so we're even praying for those that we know, maybe even our own family, who are holding on to those grudges, that ill will against others. From there we pray, lead us not into temptation. Sort of a peculiar translation, that's part of the problem. But really we're asking God for the grace to recognize, to resist, and overcome temptation. Every one of us here faces temptation be it from the devil, or could be from another person, could be from something else in this world, or even our own human weakness. We pray for the grace to resist, to recognize, to resist, to overcome. Keep in mind, as the saints said, God will not let us be tempted beyond our strength. The idea of temptation, why God would allow it, is to make us stronger, by rejecting that temptation, by resisting, overcoming, by not sinning, you and I grow stronger, especially when we're dealing with our own human weaknesses. We pray also to be delivered from evil. 
Well, you and I know we live in a world that has a lot of evil. Just thinking of all the different terrorist attacks, whether out of our country or within our country, evil would want us to live in fear. Evil would want to move us to despair. That's Satan's plan. But instead, we pray to be strong, to have that grace of fortitude from the Holy Spirit to face life in a blessed way, even if we have to face, like some of the early martyrs did, great persecution, so be it. We will be triumphant if we keep our eyes on the cross. Christ is always victorious. So my brothers and sisters, it's a very simple, quick explanation of the Our Father, but a beautiful prayer. This is a prayer that you and I do need to meditate on, to pray with our hearts. We have to pray it also with confidence. This is why Jesus emphasizes some of those points. He says, after giving the Our Father, I tell you, ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So if we're praying the Our Father, we should do so with the confidence that the Father hears all our prayers. Even the deepest prayers within our hearts, he hears them and he will grant them. Keep in mind though, God is God. So God will grant the prayer, but according to what is good, when we're ready, and what is best for us. So the answer may well be yes. The answer could be yes, but you aren't ready yet. Or it could be no, I have a better answer for you. This is important for us to realize. So if we think of Abraham in our first passage, Abraham's having this sort of negotiation with Almighty God about Sodom and Gomorrah, this wicked city. Well, God's listening, he's hearing, but God's going to do what is just. Sodom and Gomorrah did not repent. The only ones saved, Lot, his wife, and the two daughters, despite Abraham's pleas. But it certainly did shape people up. So my brothers and sisters, we look at our own lives, trusting, having confidence. Our Lord goes on, though, and he says that if what father would hand his son a snake when he asks for a fish, hand him a scorpion when he asks for an egg. Maybe there's been times when we've prayed so fervently for something, had our heart really set on the answer, and yet that's not the answer we receive. We may even wonder, is God even listening? It's sort of like we do get the snake, we get the scorpion instead of the fish or the egg. I'll give you an example. My brother's an architect, and a few years ago, a headhunter called him. And the headhunter said this firm in Pennsylvania is looking to expand, to start an office here in Northern Virginia, and they want him to start the office, and so on. Looked like a great opportunity. So goes through all the interviews and so on. Things look very hopeful. He says, please pray about this. This would be a great gift for me, and so on. So time goes on. All of a sudden, it's like no communication. What happened? And he would call, but oh, we're still thinking, no communication. Finally, it was like, well, I sort of give up. But quite frankly, he was bummed out about it, to say the least. Well, a few months later, he heard that the firm in Pennsylvania had gone bankrupt. And he said to me, you know, the dear Lord was really looking out after me because here I was praying for this job, and if I had taken it, I wouldn't be employed right now. The Heavenly Father will not let us down. We have to pray with confidence, knowing he loves us beyond our imagining. There was a prayer that was found in a Confederate soldier's pocket who had died at Gettysburg. He had he'd been cared for by the Daughters of Charity. And this is what he had written. I asked God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I asked for health that I might do greater things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I asked for riches that I might be happy. 
I was given poverty that I might be wise. I asked for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need for God. I asked for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but everything I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men most richly blessed. My brothers and sisters, we are richly blessed. We have the Father who loves us through his Son who has redeemed us and who has poured forth the Holy Spirit. So when we pray the Our Father this day, open up your hearts and know his love. Pray it every day and know his love. May God bless you.